Hi, this is Greg Weissman, the voice of Lucas Carr, and you're listening to Whelm, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D-01. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D-1-2. Hello, team. Welcome to Scream Something, Volume 2. My name is Rich, and I am here with my co-host, Emily. Hi, everyone. In Scream Something, Rich and I will be sharing our initial thoughts and reactions and general screaming for the episodes of Season 3 that were released last Friday. There will be plenty of Aster in these episodes, but we'll be saving our deeper analysis for the full episode breakdowns we have planned for after the mid-season finale. I can't believe this. They've only been living in here five minutes. It's already a mess. You're sure they went to Infinity Island? The one place we very specifically told them not to go? Yep. Well, what goes around comes around. What's that supposed to mean? Uh, Cadmus ring any bells? Oh, man. I hate being the grown-up. <laughs> and with all that out of the way, let's dive in. Hello, Megan! So, the titles for this week's episode are Private Security, Away Mission, and Rescue Op. They were released on January 11th of 2019, and the in-episode dates cover August 1st through August 6th across all three episodes. The directors this week were Vinton Hoek. I'm guessing. We're guessing? Hoek? 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 One of those. I'm sorry. Who dir- Vinton, I, I, I offer to you our standard invitation to come on the show and correct your pronunciation of your name. We're so sorry. Uh, who directed both Private Security and Rescue Op, and Mel Zwire, back to direct Away Mission. Uh, and the writers were Michael Vogel, Nicole Dubuque, one of our faves, Woo-hoo! and uh, Joshua Hale Fialkoff, uh, who directed oh. those episodes in that, that was order. Good. Yeah, that, I think that was it. Yeah. That was <laughs> With a question mark on the end <laughs> for that pronunciation. Joshua, you're welcome, Don, as well. Yes. All right, let's do this mission briefing. Okay. Just in time for your next mission. In our pre-credit scenes for episode four, we find the team from last episode has returned home. Halo is staying with Artemis and Will and Leon at their house. Brion is at McGann and Connor's home in Happy Harbor. And Jefferson Pierce, aka Black Lightning, has put up Dr. Jace at a hotel. And none of them are particularly happy with Dick Grayson right about now. <laughs> no, my boy's dropping the ball. <laughs> uh, post credit scenes, we see Dick, Jim Harper, a.k.a. the First Guardian, and Roy Harper, a.k.a. Arsenal, entering Bow Hunter Security. <laughs> I, can't, I can't even with this episode. I love it. I love it. But also, <laughs> it's a lot. A, a private... <laughs> Always on point. Uh, A private security agency owned by Will Harper. Uh, Dick asked for Will's help with a mission to dismantle a meta-trafficking ring in Star City. Will agrees, but only if Dick, Roy, and Jim help him with the security gig guarding a shipment of good goggles. We then cut to Halo and Artemis, who are walking through the park on the way to an appointment Artemis is keeping, apparently, while kids around them are playing an augmented reality game on the ubiquitous good goggles. And <laughs> I'm sure it's all fine. <laughs> it's fine. There's, there's no, they're just there. It's just world they're good. building. They're good with an E. <laughs> Uh, We get a cutscene back to episode three where we see Artemis deciding to take care of Halo since Dick wasn't taking responsibility at that time or now. Uh, The two enter a weeping willow uh, back in the park and meet with Dr. Fate, who scans Halo at Artemis's request and states that he senses an old soul in Halo. But then Zatanna arrives and we discover that apparently Dr. Fate allows her and her father to meet for one hour every year. And Rich is killed by it. Yes, I'm dead. Rich watched these episodes as a ghost. Yes. Well, I then was then resurrected. <laughs> and uh, because I needed to see us cut to Bow Hunter Security. 
I can't even. We can't say the phrase bow hunter security. <laughs> it's so good. Guarding a shipment of good goggles, which seems routine until we see that Brick and three of his goons have decided to steal the shipment in broad daylight. Uh, we then quickly cut to Jeff and Dr. Jace talking about old mistakes and new starts. Cut back to the warehouse again, where Will finally recognizes one of the drivers as Brick's thug. And a <laughs> and hilarity ensues. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. A, a chase ensues along uh, the Pacific Highway. Cutting back again, we then cut to find Connor, who is at home repairing a motorcycle. Apparently, professionally, he gets paid to fix bikes. I which have is kinda thoughts. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Which I think them. is super cool. Yeah. And uh, also trying to get <laughs> Brian to recognize that he has a rage problem. Yeah, it's an important step here. Uh, back in the park, Halo remembers pieces of her life before the cemetery, but decides not to tell Artemis about it. Zatanna and Zatara end their visit, and Sedana breaks down, revealing why Artemis is there in the first place to go give her friends some support. And Rich dies again. And yeah, so- I died a lot in this episode. <laughs> and so did I. I have a lot of feelings. <laughs> Meanwhile, Roy, Will, Jim, and Dick stop the hijacking, but during the hilarious conflict, (laughs) Will calls Dick out on wanting a substitute for Wally, someone to keep him in check and take him to task if needed. And Will takes that role, telling Dick he is being irresponsible about the new kids and convinces him that he needs to step away from his solo work and be a part of a team again. The episode ends with Roy, Will, Jim, and Dick back in full costumes, having broken up the trafficking ring Dick was starting at, was talking about at the start. I just have to pause that episode. Okay, all right. Then into episode five. <laughs> episode fine. five begins. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> this is fine. Gotta have a spinoff. Gotta gotta see more of this. Uh, episode five begins on New Genesis. Uh, where a group of quote-unquote bugs, including one named Forager, make a trade deal with the new god Orion, only to be betrayed by him. In the ensuing uh, fight with the new gods, the bugs are injured by Orion's metahuman henchmen, and the Hive vows revenge. After the credits, in Happy Harbor, Connor and McGann's afternoon is interrupted first by Breon fighting with his brother on the phone, and then by the arrival of Bear, one of the new gods from Season 1, who is a riot. Bear has apparently come to Earth to get Earthling expertise in figuring out what happens during the opening fight scene. While Connor has to stay behind to help Nightwing deal with Brion and Halo, McGann assembles her team to assist, and they boom tube to New Genesis. On New Genesis, our heroes are confronted by the bugs while investigating, and tensions run high as Bear insists that the Orion who betrayed the bugs was apparently actually an imposter. And back in Happy Harbor, Dick, Artemis, Halo, and Jefferson arrive in Happy Harbor to try and work out a plan on what to do with these metahuman kids. The adults weigh their options, agreeing that it might not be the best idea to let either Halo or Brion join the team under the circumstances, while the metahuman teens test out their powers outside. Because that's what happens when you leave superpowered children alone. <laughs> <laughs> On New Genesis, Orion, or who we think is Orion, attempts to make another deal with the bugs, but McGann recognizes that he's using telepathy to manipulate the situation and confronts him in her white Martian form. Yeah, that took me off guard. Yeah. Uh, we'll in get Happy to it. Harbor, <laughs> Brian is still unable to effectively control his powers and causes collateral damage during his test. Halo spars with Artemis for hers and discovers that her yellow aura allows her to create energy blasts, but accidentally knocks herself out when testing them. Back on New Genesis, McGann interrogates quote-unquote Orion and reveals that not only is he a white Martian posing as a new god, he's her little brother Makam. He's on New Genesis doing a few favors, quote-unquote, in exchange for help with the white Martian revolution that's apparently starting on Mars, and tries to recruit McGann for his cause. Expectedly, she refuses, and a psychic combat ensues. <laughs> that's pretty rad. It's 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 real good. We'll talk about it. We got things to say. We about got a brother. lot of things to say about it. Yeah. <laughs> we cut back to Happy Harbor, where Halo is reflexively healing herself, and when Brion tries to leave. Nightwing offers to help him find his sister, Tara, if he stays behind. So he does, 
because sometimes you just need a little motivation to to join the superheroes. <laughs> Back on New Genesis, the team rushes in to save McGann and has to fight both the metahumans and the bugs while she battles her brother on the psychic plane. McCom reminds her of the oppression they faced on Mars and insists that the only way to overcome it is through rage and violence. Uh, McGann tries to reason with him, telling him that choosing love over anger will yield better results, but he refuses. And while McGann prevails in the fight, McCom then kills the two medit teens he had with him in retaliation and escapes. In the wake of the fight, Forager is banished from his hive for enlisting the help of Bear and the team, but McGann offers to have him return to Earth with them, which he agrees to, despite his sadness about it. There's so much going on in these episodes. There really is. And these are condensed These are condensed summaries, guys. There's a yeah, lot happening summaries. here. Yep. Episode 6 opens with Black Spider attempting to assassinate a man in Alkaya. I'm going to say that's the way it's pronounced, which is the capital city of Bialya. Thank you, YJ Wiki. And while he is unsuccessful, an unseen partner crushes the man with a giant boulder, completing the assassination mission. After the credits, we cut to Gotham City, where we learn that A, Barbara, is in a wheelchair now. And B, she and Dick are a couple. And in Happy Harbor, Halo and Brian's bonding time is interrupted by the introduction of the group's latest adopted stray teenager, Forager. During the conversation, Halo displays a surprisingly comprehensive knowledge of New Genesis, but we'll get to that in a minute. Since no one has any idea what to do with Forager, McGann suggests having him and Brian live in the bioship, now shape-changed into the form of an RV. <laughs> You were right. I can't believe I was right, but apparently I was right. <laughs> well done. If you heard our Crashing the Mode last episode, you'll know what we're talking about. All right, go ahead, Emily. <laughs> A call from Dr. Jace reveals that Brion's sister, Tara, did in fact have the metagene and probably also had geoforce powers. Nightwing then connects this to the assassination we saw in the opening scene, saying that Tara might be working with the League of Shadows now. Brion demands to know where the League is, and Nightwing tells him the location of their base, but orders him not to, in to investigate until they have a solid plan. Brion almost immediately disregards that order, and he, <laughs> Halo, and Forager... Classic. <laughs> Classic Young Justice. Yep. <laughs> that and blowing up things on and investigation missions. Secret missions, right? <laughs> <laughs> Two hallmarks. <laughs> Two <laughs> But after immediately disregarding that order, he, Halo, and Forager steal, borrow, convince, supercycle to help them. Uh, invite. Invite. <laughs> One of these words. Uh, and head for Infinity Island. Meanwhile, Oracle finds Halo's real identity and shares it with Nightwing. But when he and the other adults go to tell her the news, they discover that all the kids are gone because they've just arrived on Infinity Island. There they find Sensei, who informs them that Terra is not on the island, and a fight ensues. Sorry, I'm just laughing at how the fight ensued because they destroyed Sensei's meditation <laughs> platform. During which Sensei kills Halo, again, and <laughs> captures the rest of the group with the help of Ubu and a mysterious ninja. Uh, in the island's dungeon, Halo's healing powers bring her back to life again, and the group is rescued by the arrival of Nightwing, Superboy, Miss Martian, Tigress, and Black Lightning, who pursued the teens in the bioship. During their escape, our heroes are attacked by Sensei and his ninja and Ubu. Like, there's not that many people on this island, no. but Rachel Gould breaks up the fight and tells Nightwing to take the kids and leave. He also informs the group that not only is he no longer the head of the shadows, he's no longer part of the light. After the team leaves, a mysterious woman steps out of the shadow <laughs> holding a baby. No one knows who she is. Yeah, we'll talk about her in a minute. Uh, one of the ninja is apparently regaining his memory after having recognized Nightwing as Grayson. And we're left with uh, a lot of questions and excitement <laughs> to be filled in on crashing the mode. To be crashed finally in back, the mode. <clears throat> to be crashed in the mode. Finally back on the bio ship. In a perfect callback to episode two of season one, Nightwing berates the three teens for disobeying orders, but agrees to let them form their own team. I There's like, there's, this is going to be long. There's so much, guys. We so can't much let happens. this go too long. 
We got to We'll try to keep it reined in, but so much happens and there's so many specific things that like are yeah. targeted directly at the stuff we love. I have to tell you, I wasn't sure that I'd have more Aster than the first three episodes. I, I mean, I was hoping, but I was trying to be like, no, I hope it's at least as good. Oh, gee, my goodness. There's a lot going on. My good goggles. <laughs> is, that, is that the new exclamation? My good goggles. Well, yeah, until they turn out to be. Hey, I'm the, I'm the one who's had suspicions. <laughs> we all have. I literally wrote that in my notes like four times. But we should probably get <laughs> to that three, Aster. All three of us put those notes in. <laughs> Let's feel this Aster. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the Aster. Want me to start or do you want to start? Uh, I'll start this time. Woo. How about that? Sure. Emily was right about the truck. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who may have skipped our crashing the mode last week because you don't want spoilers, which I totally understand, I, in our crashing the mode, threw out the possibility that the ending credits were about the team's pets and that the random truck that we saw at the end of episode three might be the bio ship in disguise. And then Blew it turns my out- my crazy idea was absolutely <laughs> right, and that absolutely totally was Bioship, and <laughs> yes, I was very yes. happy. <laughs> it's really, really cool. Yeah, I don't have much else to say. I want to see. It. I want to see the outsiders driving around the U.S. in this RV, though. I love It'd be it. Hilarious. I do. Yeah. I do think it's interesting with the Bioship, though, because we we see Bioship both as the RV and as Bioship in these episodes. And it looks like the designs changed a bit. Like you threw out the idea last week that maybe like Bioship has evolved and it kind of looks like she has a little bit. Yeah. The- I kind of feel like I feel like it makes sense to me that both sphere that is a shape changing object that could and we already knew in the first you know two seasons. Yep. That sphere can adapt herself to however many you know, people there are that need to be transported and like, you know, Wolf gets a sidecar and like, you know, we've already seen that. So it makes sense that if she can evolve, she's going to evolve and change herself as she wants to change herself. And the same thing with the bio ship. If, if the bio ship can transform, we've seen it in this, you know, stasis egg form and doing all this other stuff. It makes sense that the longer that she's on earth, the more that she's going to be able to see you know, earth vehicles and other stuff and be able to imitate those things. I love it. Me too. And then I die. And then no, you die. Uh, Zatanna and Zatara. That, once again, it's, I don't, I don't know what to say. It's like a, the Z- Zatanna Zatara story arcs are like a writing 101, like representation of how you get a character. <laughs> On the screen for like, what, 90 seconds of screen time? Yep. And hardcore develop character, right? And carry that through. Also, the fact that they brought that up early on in this season in the same way that you were talking about um, in last last week's Crashing the Mode, Emily brought up basically a mini Super Sweethearts, which is not really a... Not really much of a crashing the mode. It just happened to be there where she was talking about the fact that the proposal happened in episode one means that they're going to do something in the next 25 episodes that has something to do with that. You don't just introduce that and then just don't deal with it for 25 episodes. Same thing with this. This is episode, what was that, episode four? Yes. So, yeah, episode four out of 26. So we're going to we're going to get something is going on with this story arc. If even if it's just planting seeds for the next season, they're reminding us that this is a thing. Yeah. And there's a reason why. So I'm and I loved it, too. And I and I and this is so specific to us as a show, but I think it's really interesting that that scene hit both of us super hard from completely different perspectives because you are a dad and. I am and I am a young woman with a dad. So like yes. that scene hurts no matter who you are and it is yeah. beautiful and I loved that mini plot line. And, and on on Twitter we had uh, one of the listeners, I think it was David Renard, he had he had posted up he was like, "Man, an hour? Like what a jerk." <laughs> like and he's like, "Why why is this a thing?" And I'm like, "Dr. Fate is not a lord of good." <laughs> Dr. Fate is a lord of order. He is basically the good guy equivalent of Vader. Like, 
you got to point him in the right direction because in his mind, if you if everybody's staying in their lane when they're driving on the road, then everybody's safe. <laughs> Don't pull out of your lane. This is the Lord of order, right? And so, and he was put, I mean, I'd have to go back and, and look again, but it, it seemed like he was put on the shelf by Nelson for decades. Yeah. So he took it off and then didn't put it back on until in even until the day he died. So fate's like, and look what happened while I was gone. Yeah. The, you know, the, the world went, was so, is so chaotic that Clarion's running around and all of this stuff. So at this point, he's just like, no, this is the deal. I'm now making a deal. <laughs> like I did one time, this one time I decided not to make it, somebody sign a contract and look what happened. <laughs> so this is what I'm doing now. And when he takes the helmet off and he's all white haired and yeah. he just looks, he looks so haggard. I'm just like, oh, it makes man. Me, it makes me so worried because like that's, yeah. that's a, like, he's that's a lot of aging it. for seven years. <clears throat> that's. Yes. Yes, it is. And it makes me wonder, like, I mean, Kent was alive into his hundreds, yeah. right? But how long did he keep the helmet off for? Yeah. I mean, Wotan was like, I've been preparing for your return. And it's like, this was not a short period of time. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. I'm really worried that I'm really worried. Yeah. We'll see. Him. We'll see what happens. Yeah. And like uh. one thing that I noticed watching that episode and with those scenes, because I know I know everyone has been crying about these scenes. It's not just us. Uh, but those scenes could have so easily felt out of place considering what like the main plot line of this episode is this just funny literal buddy cop thing of them going and yeah. having the security thing but it doesn't and i think part of it is because the whole episode every single plot ties in to this theme of like parenthood that they've been dealing with specifically in that episode but kind of over the whole season where every yeah. scene in that episode like the zatanna zatara stuff is explicitly about that but right. then you have like Connor is dealing with Brion and trying to get through to this kid. And you have right. Artemis trying to communicate with Halo. And even with the buddy cop hilarious highway robbery nonsense that we loved in this episode, right. a lot of it is about Roy having to step up and be like, hey, kid, you're not doing what you need to do. You're not taking responsibility for your actions. You mean you mean Will. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I do the same thing. <laughs> Dad Harper. Right. Dad, there you go. Dad Harper. Dad uh, I'm, Harper I'm in. of the three I'm, Harpers. I'm in. <laughs> and like even during that, they throw in a line that uh, I think Neil pointed out too. And I noticed when they put it in there that he points out that part of why he likes his job is because it means he can get home in time to have dinner with his daughter. And like they don't right. need that line, but they put it in there to make all of these things connect better. Oh, the other thing that I think is important is the way they could have just shown Zatanna and Zatara. Yeah. But they have Artemis be there. And the fact yes. that she's been there every year for seven years. And she's bringing Halo. And then they tie Dr. Fate into revealing this thing about Halo. Like, so again, each scene is doing more than one thing. Like, this scene is about reminding us that Zatanna and Zatara are a thing. That this is about family. It's it's giving information about a main character for this set, this current season. It's reinforcing old friendships. It's showing Artemis being responsible and being a good friend and person. Yeah. Like there's so many things going on in this, right? In these in this one scene that ties it to everything else. So you could have I agree with you, you could have a scene like this that would just be a callback to something that happened two seasons ago and have no one understand. Right. Or new watchers who wouldn't haven't watched the first two seasons for some reason wouldn't get. <laughs> I don't think this season makes any sense if you haven't watched the first two seasons, Rich. I think it'd be tough. I agree with you. I think if, if you haven't, go watch those. I don't know why I'm giving that advice. But anyway. <laughs> All right. Enough of that. That 90 seconds of screen time was. <laughs> it was a lot. Was gonna, it was a good 90 we're gonna, seconds. We're going to dive more into it, I think, later on. And. To throw out a bit of levity about those 90 seconds that break my heart, I just want to give a shout out to Phil Barassa that I really like Zatanna's civilian clothes in that scene. It was a real cute nice. outfit. I'd buy that outfit. And that has nothing to do with anything other than I noticed it and appreciated it. I think I think the scene was rough as it was, like in a good way. But what really punched the time card on that scene was Halo at the end saying, this is why we're, this is the part we're here for. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, 
oh, really? Okay, enough of that. Let's go. Let's go to something. Wait, no, more uplifting and not uplifting. Oracle. We see Oracle. We do see Oracle. And Dick flirting, and it's adorable. It's it's real. Also, cute. <laughs> we finally get the answer. Oracles in a wheelchair. Yes. So something happened, but we don't know what it is. Something happened in the last two years between seasons. I'll, I'll say, I've said it basically before. I'm going to say it again here. It, if it, this is a spin on what happened in the Killing Joke, I just hope that this Young Justice version of Barbara had a lot more agency in her fate that happened. I don't necessarily mind her being shot by the Joker or that kind of stuff, but she... Yeah, she was really kind of fridged in that. So I would I would like this to be different this time. But I, I actually am glad that she is in the wheelchair. I just want the reason to be better explained. I totally agree. And I also think that having it happen between seasons like this and being able to just start post all of that storyline, whatever it might be, and just start with this is Oracle, this is the new status quo, is actually a really great way of handling it. Because it allows them to do the strongest part of that character arc, that is the aftermath and Oracle taking control of her life and all of that without, at least right now, depending on what they do later with flashbacks or anything, without having to touch on what could be even handled really, really well can still occasionally come off as a very problematic cause for how we got to that very strong character conclusion, not conclusion, outcome. Uh, right. So having it be between seasons, I think, works really well for me of just going, you can just fill in those blanks and you don't need to see that whatever it might have been. Do you think, as someone who does not have a decades long history with Barbara and Dick, do you, does it, did it help the fact that you read the tie-in comic, that final tie-in comic that at least was alluding to the fact that they have some kind of dynamic because yes. I know that that tie-in comic frustrated you a little bit. And they're like, wait, where'd this come from? It felt like a little bit out of left field. But now we see this. Did it help lay that groundwork? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think because like, I want I want to see how they got together. Like, I want more of that. I want more expansion on that relationship because it is such a core of the DC universe, but it is feels very secondary on the show in comparison to the way that it is often handled in DC comics. And yeah. because it is so... it's. One of those ships in DC Comics that people just know. People know Robin and Batgirl. People this way that people know Superman and Lois Lane. Like you can introduce that, and most people will be like, "Ah, yes, of course." So, yeah. like, I didn't. I want more with them, but I don't think it is entirely necessary. Like, I didn't think that this came out of left field, and I think the tie-in comic helped. And the little bits that they did in season one and two, like very little bits that they did, also helped. Yeah. But I also think that I thought this when I first saw it, that having them be an established relationship in the season and having our first introduction to them as a couple being super casual and super flirty and adorable is exactly what they had to do to make this work. Because mm. they ne- that conversation that they have in her apartment gives us a look at like, oh, this is an established ongoing thing. They have yeah. a solid relationship. They This is not new. This is not any of that. This is not something that they are figuring out. This is something that they are. And yeah. having that makes it work a lot better, I think. Because if they had tried to in this season, like start having them get together, I feel like it would have been a lot weaker than just being like, they're together. We're showing it to you through showing that they are casual with each other, which is a really easy, strong way to do that, in my opinion, for these two. Yeah. It still brings up some questions about why is she a secret? Yeah. <laughs> not not Barbara, but Oracle. Like, it makes me think, like, do they think Barbara's dead? I don't like, do, I Are they not. pulling that pulling that again? Because I, I, I don't know if I'd be really excited about that bit. But, like, Oracle, <sighs> I don't know. Maybe she just hasn't been... Maybe maybe after whatever happened happened and she decided to, you know, help Dick with his field work, solo field work, maybe she just hasn't been introduced as that character, you know, to the rest of the DC universe. I, I don't know. We got there's a lot of questions. Anyway, let's move on from that because I think there's gonna be a whole super sweethearts probably about this situation. Depend- I'm depending guessing. on how it goes for the rest of the season, I may have enough to <laughs> to do one for them. I hope so. I want to. I think I think so. There's a lot of history to go over there too. Anyway. 
A um, couple things. Is that Snapper Carr's house? Yeah, this was my question. I, I wrote this down like the second he showed up where I'm like, I have a lot of questions about why Snapper Carr is here in episode five. Like he even he has a line where he says, be careful of my trees when talking of my trees. to them. I think they're staying in his house. And and because he's like when he shows up, I was like, oh, Snapper's here. That's cool. And I'm like, Snapper's totally at home here reading the newspaper, <laughs> grabbing a cup of coffee. You know what I mean? I was like, okay, interesting. Uh, that's interesting. And then he also he also mentions he's like, yeah, you know, I led the Joker to Mount Justice that one time. And uh, if you can read that story again, if you haven't read it before, it's in like one of the very early tie-in comics, actually, um, where we also find out why Superboy hates monkeys. <laughs> but like, yeah, that line raised so many that one line that should just be a throwaway joke but instead i'm like okay but like what is this living situation what is going on here right and like if he does it because like we hadn't seen him there in any of the other episodes that we have seen this house and we don't see him in the next episode that is also at this house so i'm like what is maybe he's working he works no it's the summer Oh, that's right. He's not teaching it. Well, that doesn't mean he's not work. It means he could be doing something else. He's okay. just not teaching. I don't know. I have too many questions about this. There's a lot of questions. But you know what's really funny? Total missed opportunity that Neil pointed out. <laughs> when when Snapper said, I, I led the Joker to the Mount Justice one time, <laughs> Neil said, I really wanted Connor to say, I know. <laughs> <laughs> And then just have Snapper look at him with like a raised eyebrow and then like move on, (laughs) which I would have loved. There has got to be something about like spheres rolling around is so echoed. Maybe I'm even inspired by the bugs rolling around. Yeah. Yeah. Like the development of the technology like inspired this this thing. So you have this bonding, which gets me to another point, actually. Foragers immediately accepted by Halo. For reasons. For, reason, for, for reasons that I mentioned in our Crashing the Mode last time. She clearly knows all about his world and that kind of stuff. She's excited about that. He's accepted by Brion because he is an outcast. He's, been, he's also been outed from his people and not being able to go back, which I think is great. And he's accepted by Sphere. Like they're like doing stuff together. They're like, he, he's bonding with them on these different levels. And it's so fascinating to me. I'm like, what a great, they're really spending the time putting the, the links between the different characters and having it be so that they feel like they're a warm team. Like, especially like when Forager says, you gave me food, <laughs> you know, you are part of my hive. And, and then, and then Halo. You've got the voice down. <laughs> And then Halo's like, and Brion, you gave me food, so you're part of the hive too. Like, you know, like it's just like it. It just it it's works real for cute. me. It's, it's real, real cute. cute. I love it. Yeah, I really Jason. Love it. Jason Spizak, we love you. Like, Forager is freaking adorable. <laughs> Watching it for the first time, I remember there was some. I forget what it was. There was something in some interview or something where they're like, "Yeah, Forager's really cute," and they like showed the first art and I'm like. Forager's not cute. And then the second I heard Forager's voice, I'm like, no, Forager is adorable. I love him. Yes. I want a plushie of him and I want it now. <laughs> I love I love McGann's like, where Connor's like, yeah, she taught you everything but the pronouns. <laughs> and McGann gets all offen- defensive. It makes me so happy. <laughs> they have like, a very complicated self-identity. Because <laughs> it's, it's both like great world building because it explains yeah. that tick really nicely. But it's also right. just like, that great little moment between all of them. It made me really happy. I don't even because know the, why. It's just a cool speaking thing. In, speaking in third person is always, a, it's just, a, it's a trope that's goes, that people go to a lot with aliens or people who don't speak yeah. English or whatever, but they made a clear explanation, which makes perfect sense. Yeah. And I'm like, really. oh, I love it. I love it. I love everything here. Please continue. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is one of the, I, this is the only time I'm going to mention a voice actor, I think. We'll see. <laughs> so far, Kyung Young. So the voice of 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 Sensei, I'm just like yes, that I know that guy from everywhere, and I cannot figure out. I, I know that voice, and then I realized he's from Avatar: The Last Airbender. There is a Fire Nation uh, deserter that Aang goes to to first train 
in firebending and it all goes terribly wrong. <laughs> That's the voice there. And he's also Commander Sato in Star Wars Rebels, which is where I've heard him the most recently. He's great. And he's only had like two lines in the first couple of seasons, I think. And he's he's fantastic. So I love that. I actually hope we get more of him. I love his There's something so rich about his voice. I don't know what it is, but I really, really like it. Love Brion wearing Superboy's <laughs> clothes at the end of that episode. So, so do so I. Larry, it's hilarious. And it was one hilarious, too. The fact that they bothered to draw them as absolutely not fitting him was hilarious. Right. <laughs> right. And three, the implication that that means they just keep clothes for Superboy on the bio ship because it's apparently enough of a problem during missions. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I guess that makes sense too. Yeah, and just because him and McGann co-own the bio it's ship, it's not expensive. Yeah, it's their. It, yeah, I mean they were probably living in it for a long time. There's probably a bio ship closet in there just full of Superboy outfits. And then uh, the last thing I had was the way that they had Dick quoting Bruce at the very end was so good. But he did it at first. I was like, it looks like you're doing that not on purpose. <laughs> And then after Brion was like, no, this is what we're going to do. And Dick's like, that's what I wanted to hear. And I'm like, you were totally <laughs> doing it on purpose. purpose. You were doing it on purpose. And you were doing it for reasons because you're Dick Grayson, not because you're Bruce. Right? Yes. I love it. I loved uh, it. It was so good. And the so fact good. that it's immediately followed up with Connor being like, you're leading another team. And Nightwing's like, don't, don't uh. remind me. <laughs> I love it. And of course, so Nightwing and the Outsiders, which, you know, of course, the original comic was Batman and the Outsiders. And I'm going to have more to say about this in a minute, but they do such a good job in this show of translating character dynamics from the Justice League into, you know, the the team, you know, like Bizarro is often really referred to as a as a Superman villain. But in, in, in that case, I, I, as I understand it, one of our listeners let me know that the, the first appearance of Bizarro was actually in super, one of the Superboy comics. And so it actually came fully around. So now you've got you know, this Bizarro slash match character being a Superboy character. And it also ties into McGann's brother, actually. So let's get into that for a minute. <laughs> There's a lot to say. Well, first of all, I want to say Neil's Neil's first thing that I actually didn't notice until he pointed it out was that McGann's brother says that there's confirms that there are red and green and white Martians. Yes. And we saw reds in the, the comic tie in, but it was also weird because McGann was being an unreal, unreliable narrator in that scene so we Seems saw like that there real, were reds. Really detail to make up though like, no i, I agree with you <laughs> I, I agree but now we know like okay there's reds there's whites and there's greens and there's not great stuff going on but i didn't catch the reds being actually mentioned this is the first time they've been mentioned as far as i know i can't remember any other time they're mentioned outside of just being shown in a panel you know in the comics so let's get into mcgann's brother that's all you yeah I've got a lot of things from these episodes. You want me to start with McGann's brother or want me to go yeah, back? Yeah, want you to do? start with that. And I've got some stuff, but I'm putting it in Crashing the Mode. So, like, that episode, written by Nicole Dubuque, who writes real good Miss Martian episodes. Uh, <laughs> yes, she does. She does. I love them so much. I had my suspicions from the moment Miss Martian mentioned telepathy, but I was like, don't get your hopes up. This could be anything. Don't, don't, don't do it. And then... The second she just, she's like, now, little brother, I legit screamed yes so loudly because I love that they're bringing him in. I am also absolutely here for Big Sister McGann. Like, it's so good. It's such a good dynamic. I really loved that whole conversation. And I didn't know that, I didn't know any of this stuff about her family until Brendan, Brendan Conway brought it into our Young Justice actual play. Yeah. And you mentioned him. And I was like, wait, she's got, what? She has a white brother? Like, you were like, it was my, was it Was it my dad? And yeah. I was like, he goes, oh, I guess her dad's white. That makes sense. And then she was like, or, oh, my brother. I'm like, what is happening? And I had to go and like look up all that stuff after that actual play. And so to see him in this was so cool. That remains one of the 
the craziest moments from our actual play to me because me and Brendan Conway were on like the same wavelength totally. and everyone else at the table was confused. And I thought it was crazy that I was somehow the only person there who knew this fact. <laughs> I had no worked, idea. It worked so well in that story because he literally, he goes, so you good. see a white Martian and I go, is it my dad? And everyone at the table was like, wait, what? Who? What do you know? Yeah. What is happening? And he's just like, no, it's your brother. And that was the, that was the third time he had done that to me. Yes. In that actual play. That was the third time my jaw dropped. Unbelievable. But the But yeah, go listen to our actual play, guys. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, apparently. So the, the thing that I was uh, alluding to a minute ago was the fact that uh Ma'ala Fa'ak was actually John Jones's brother in the comics. And so they brought this character into in the Young Justice universe into being McGann's brother. Yeah. So that we can utilize that character, but have him be closer tied, obviously, to the main characters that the show is focusing on. And the way that they dealt with it was so interesting, because I remember it came up in one of the tie-in comics. Miss Martian casually mentions the existence of, a, 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 I can't say the word, but yeah. That Ma'ala Fa'ak. Ma'ala it was Fa'ak in, and it was our comic commentary for issues 12 and 13. Yeah. I looked it up. And when we talked about it, you were like, in the original comics, he was this, but I guess it's just this weird creature in this universe. And instead, they did both, and it's so good. Uh, yeah, I got some crashing the mode on that. Yeah, <laughs> and their whole their whole mind battle between those two characters is so good. The flashback to their childhood. Oh, oh God, it hurt my heart. And also, yeah. ti tiny white Martians are also really cute. This whole episode was a lot of me going, "That thing shouldn't be cute," but then it was. Um, <laughs> But it was all these little details, like the fact that McGann's mental self-image of herself is as humanoid. Yeah. And that like her her brother calls her out on that. And she's like, no, we're not dealing with this right now. That's that's me. That's my stuff. Don't worry about it. Right. And right. McGann actually trying to talk him through it because and pointing out the fact that she could at any moment take him down and is instead trying to not do that. She is yeah. actively being like, I could, I could literally kill you right now. I'm not. I don't want to. And that whole conversation that they have and seeing her more grounded attitude toward the ethics of her powers in that scene and in these episodes in general, because Connor brings it up in, in episode four at one point. Yep. Is so good. I love that they're acknowledging it and showing the way she has grown and processed everything that she's able to do. And, <laughs> her having the literally the power of love and friendship saving the day again like my heart i was waiting for you to mention a specific scene that happened right at the end there where he says can you teach me and she says yes and then he tries to Attack he tries her, to bushwhack her and cut. and the defense yep <laughs> what defends her is the image of superboy <laughs> ah yes and it's also so good it's so good i also want to point out as like reverse crashing the mode here all the way back in bereft when she is fighting simon and they have that moment where her and connor mind meld for uh -huh. a second and then he's like yeah. i'm gonna go fight the bad guys in the real world you take care of this the first thing she does after that is create a shield that is shaped like the superman shield uh -huh. so this is just tying back around to that and i yeah. love it I love it so much because also the like crazy mind laser that her brother used hits directly in the middle of the shield on Connor's chest and it makes me Yeah, happy. it's real it's good. It's real good. It's real yeah. good put together here, guys. I love this scene so much. <laughs> Sorry to knock you off your uh, off your pattern here on your notes, but I, yeah, there's a lot to talk about with that. There really is. It. And we'll definitely dive a lot deeper into it when we go into this episode as a standalone and you know what we still we still don't know what happened at the end of season two when aqualad says barzoom is looking for help on mars and we don't we don't know what that mission was the tie we don't know what happened there the tie-in comic that we do have that references it just says mcgann and connor got along a lot more than they thought they would and got awkward and it, about and it. it and it scared connor yeah. and i have a lot of questions yeah I have so many questions. Okay, but I uh, I want to go back a couple of episodes too because I had some notes from earlier that yes. just 
The we talked a lot about how the bow hunter security thing is the funniest thing in the world, and we love it. And it is absolutely the levity that we needed this week after last week. After last week, we had dead teenagers and exile and everything being horrible. We needed Dad Harper d- <laughs> having a d- d- field trip with his clones. Like I needed that in my life. There's so much. It was like like all Crispin all the time. <laughs> And it was the music that killed me, I think, the most. The fact that every time they try to be, like, epic while in those uniforms, they wrote a musical score for it. And it's so, like, sincerely heroic, it made me laugh every single time. Hey, I'm older than Jim, but I'm prettier. (laughs) It's just just so much in a booth shouting at himself. Baby steps. Yeah, I think somebody somebody on uh, Twitter asked him, like, how you did these scenes and he said it's been so long I, I kind of forgot but he said he thinks he did each individual character like he did all of Roy's lines and then all of Will's lines and then all of Jim's line I also love for some it, I know it's a small thing but I loved watching Guardian because to do something? It, it, yeah because in the other scenes like Guardian is you know he gets taken out left and right and in this one he just the way he takes that one guy out and puts the handcuffs on him and then punches him and then puts the other handcuff on him and knocks him out. He's like, hello. Uh, he's just great. He's just big brother Harper. And I love every minute of it. Yeah. And also with all of that, it leads to, we mentioned it in the middle of that scene, in the middle of that plot line that is so, so funny and all of that. They have that moment where Nightwing calls Will Harper, Dad Harper, Wall, and our hearts break and everyone's mm-hmm. hearts break, and Roy just calls him out on, not Roy, Will, <laughs> I'm going to be mm-hmm. doing that all season, calls him out on how he needs someone like Wally to keep yeah. him grounded. And it's so good. It's such a good character decision to like point that out, because we see that a little bit in season two, that like Nightwing needs to have that fight with Wally for him to realize what the heck he's doing half the time. Yeah. And having it come up here and having Roy call him out on it is so good. I loved it. Yeah. I I also found it funny because I was talking about how Neil and I were both like, who's this dude with the beard and the mustache? Because we'd just seen the picture of Wally with the red yeah. hair and then then Will with the red hair. And in here he's like, is it just the red hair? Is that all it is? <laughs> I was like, yes. Yes, it is. It, yeah, maybe a little. <laughs> Sorry, but Yes. <laughs> And in that same episode with a with a different relationship, we mentioned it. I love Connor being a mechanic. It makes me extremely happy. Just having that progression from this teen rage monster who breaks everything to him being a man who finds meaning in fixing broken things. Yeah, for sure. Like, it's such a small scene. It's so simple. And it's such a perfect progression that I didn't even think of until it was presented. Like, I'm I'm always kind of curious of what these the young adults are doing that's getting them any money in this world when they're being superheroes all the time. And just throwing that out there, the second that was presented, I was like, oh, of course. It was obvious this entire time. We literally even saw something in season one where Superboy is fixing his bike before we find out Sphere can be a bike. He just has a motorcycle and is fixing it. So they've set this up in the middle of season one as an inconsequential thing. And now it's such a beautiful character moment and the show is written so well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think my last note from that, that first episode and into episode five and going forward forever, I want it on record that I don't trust these goggles. Yeah. Something's going on with that. And I, I don't know what it is yet. I have a couple suspicions, but I don't know where they'd be going with it. Like, just guesses about, like, oh, maybe it's this, this, or this, but, like, what? We could touch on it in Crashing the Mode if you want to. Maybe. I don't know if I have enough to be able to. We'll see. We'll see see. where it goes. Yeah. Just know. Just know that we here at Whelmed do not trust the good goggles. Yes. No one does. We're not alone. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'm on the the bridge of the. (laughs) The starship. Was it the. Engager. Engager. That's what it was. It was so good. It's because they're putting so much focus on it. It's like if it had just... Get five, be- get five feet behind me. <laughs> so good. That um, 
going into the next episode with New Genesis and everything, there were a bunch of random little details that made me super happy, like McGann's scrapbook that then oh, yeah. shows up in her in her mental fight, like it's the same pictures and everything. It was just so cute. Like I'm like, yeah, that's absolutely something she would do, and yeah. I liked seeing it. And Connor calling her his fiance made my heart melt because I'm trash and we all know it, but it was real cute. And it's good to have that reminder because we got to keep reminding. I don't remember him saying that. Who would, who did he, he say that to? When Bear shows up, he has to introduce everybody. Oh, around. that's He's like, right. Lucas, Embryon, and you know, my fiance, Megan. And he calls <laughs> You've her You've chosen Megan. well. <laughs> You've chosen your life mate well. And he's I just like, Bear. I know. And I'm like, I'm happy. I'm so happy right now. I love how Bear is Bear is like the only one who can hug Connor hard enough for him to go, ugh. He's like, dude, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that it also just that line, and you know my fiance right. shows that like this is an ongoing thing that for the past seven years, the new gods just pop in and out. Bear just shows up. And they've, yeah. met, and they've met people. And I'm like, I love it. I love that little <laughs> bit of world building. One word and you build so much of the past seven years. And I also the whole, noticed, <laughs> having watched this episode so many times, McGann, after Bear shows up, has to call in the whole team to help with this thing. And she literally calls them. All of their cell phones go off in the middle of various scenes. And apparently the whole team has an 8-bit version of he the Hello, Megan theme song <laughs> as their ringtone for McGann. <laughs> and it makes me so happy. <laughs> it's really It was really funny. I noticed that too. The first time I heard it, I was like, Wait, is that? And then I literally yeah. played the audio clips back to back, and I'm like, right. it is. Yeah, it's real funny. Because <laughs> it's not just one of them. All of them have this. Right. Like, this was a coordinated thing Why? between all of you. It's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. It's so funny. And in that, we also get, we're seeing some of that ongoing drama with uh, Cassie and Tim that, you know, I hope we get something with that. We just get her and him fighting yeah. on the phone. And the Neil, fact again, Neil mentioned that as well. <laughs> like yeah. the, whole, the whole, I can't tell you that. Oh, oh Tim. <sighs> and the fact that when they're Bloody. on the on the new Genesis and she's just complaining, like, we wish Tim was here. He'd be great at this detective thing. And she's like, yeah, sure. I bet he would. <laughs> like, Cassie, oh, Cassie. I'm so sorry. It's been two years. They've been together two solid years. Yeah. Like, boy, rough, man. be honest with your girlfriends. This is a yeah. problem Tim has in the comics, too, and I only know because of the Batgirl ones. Yeah. <sighs> Tim, Tim, be better, do, it's, be better it's with not your blonde my, girlfriends. It's what he's been like, rec like, I say recently, but just because when I was reading him in the 90s, he wasn't like this. <laughs> and then he got all angsty, and it, uh, I'd like him to not be that way. We'll see. We'll see. Because I think... I think there was a screenshot that we get some Batman and Tim showing up sometime soon. I think so. I think Cam Cam yeah. Bowen shared shared that over on Twitter. Oh, it was Cam. That's right. Cam tweeted out a picture of uh, Batman and Robin, uh, Batman and, and um, Tim specifically. So, so maybe this we'll Friday we'll find out. Yeah, that'd be cool. And speaking of a different relationship, I don't know what exactly they're building up with Halo and Brion, but it's something and I am intrigued. Like... Mm. I really like y'all can tell me that I'm reading too much into this because I'm me, but like the way that they're focusing in on their scenes and the way they're interacting reads as the prelude to a romantic relationship. Yeah, I the only reason I even noticed it was because of you. And I, I would say the same thing. And honestly, I don't know enough <laughs> yeah, yeah, about I'm the succeeding. outsiders to tell you whether or not Brion and the original Halo had a relationship or not. I have no idea. So, uh, as I mentioned, we have some have some a uh, uh, guest scheduled to come on and talk about the outsiders in a little more detail. So maybe we'll get some more with that. But I I don't know enough. So maybe. But yeah, there were there were multiple moments in these episodes that just the way they were interacting. I'm like, hmm. We'll put a pin in that. We'll see where that goes. But going towards the the end of that same episode where they've gone off to Infinity Island. One, I loved getting to see some of the OG team members fighting together again. It's just so good. Like getting to see Nightwing and Artemis and Miss Martian and Superboy even stronger and even more in sync with each other Yeah, was so much fun. And at the same time, seeing the new characters integrated into that and how they work and how they don't. Because like the thing that stood out to me is Forager goes to use his powers and goes to be helpful and knocks McGann out 
in the middle of this fight because he doesn't know and they haven't communicated that like you can't oh, use you mean, fire uh, around Miss you Martian. Mean Brion. I, you said Forager, yeah. oh, I think. Oh god, there's so many of them. I'm sorry. I know, that's okay. Geoforce. No, I did too. When Brion. he when, <laughs> when Brion did that, I was like, Oh, oh, that ooh. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. This Terrible. is why we communicate with our team. Um it's- but getting to see the way that like Artemis and Nightwing and Superboy and all of them can like play off of each other and are so in sync now after seven years is so good. And yeah, getting sure. getting that reminder because we've kind of been separate from it. But I also, with those same characters, I loved the ongoing theme and conversation in episode six and kind of in this whole season in general that all of our original teammates are the adults in the room now, but they're mm-hmm. all still really young adults, so they don't entirely know what they're doing. Yeah. And I feel that as a 20-year-old college student, but yeah. it also works really well as that progression for all of their characters. Like having Connor call the the three teens, just calling them kids really casually, and I'm here and I'm like, wait, oh, right, it's not season one anymore. You're not a kid. You are an adult in this situation. And Dick even having the line where he says, I hate being the grown up <laughs> is so good. And I love that they're including that as kind of part of the overarching narrative of this season, that yeah. all of these characters have grown up, but are still growing up at the same time. Yeah. It's it's real good. And we get to that that final fight. And it took till my third watch through to notice a thing from the comics that's in this. I didn't notice it. I was like, watching it the first time, I was like, hmm, that's a weird sword. Second watch through, I was like, yeah, weird sword. And then third watch through, I realized that Sensei has the sword from issues nine and 10 of the tie-in comics that is part of that whole storyline with Captain Adam and is a weapon that can actually kill Superboy. Oh, when you see, you put in your notes from the issues nine and 10 of the tie-in comics, and I was like... I don't know what that is. I don't remember a sword in those comics. Uh and I don't I just didn't remember what the what arc it was. There's so many arcs. Yeah. I But was it's just it's the one that down. it was the one that was created to cut through the the bodysuit slash armor that Captain Adam has, which also can cut through Superboy, which we saw in the tie in comic. Wow. Good catch. Yeah. Cause watching it the first time, there's the moment where Sensei like jumps to go attack Connor and Miss Martian stops him and moves him with her mind and part of me was like but he's Superboy you can't kill Superboy why does that matter Uh, whatever this fight's going too fast for me to bother and care and then I realize I'm like oh wait that weapon can actually kill Connor good move good move there there's a name for the uh there's a name for the alloy yeah uh the Zionizer babe Xionizer is how I pronounce it it's Xionizer yeah, I did a – so back in Comic Commentary Issues 9 and 10, I did a mini Secret Origins, and I talked a little bit about that sword. Yeah. So, yeah, it's the uh, Exionizer Blade. Yeah. And before we get into any of our crashing the mode spoilers about some of the stuff that happens on that island at the very end, I just want to say that something is up with Cheshire this season, and I don't know what it is, but it's something. Because when Cheshire asks if mm-hmm. Sportsmaster is leading, leading the League of Shadows, she gets a no. When she asks if it's Cheshire, she gets it. Get off this island, and I'm she, like, I love I've got she, what she actually got when he said sports. When she said sportsmaster, was a laugh, and then no, <laughs> a laugh, and then a no, um, ha, no. <laughs> but I also love that she's super casual about it now. She's not like, is that one villain sportsmaster involved with this? She's like, is it my dad? Right. She's just so tired. She's like, please yeah. don't let it be my dad, right? And also the fact that tying that into uh, Neil, we had mentioned earlier, had pointed out that Roy's line about getting home in time to have dinner with Leon does not mention Cheshire. Right. Cheshire, like, we're skirting around Cheshire this season, and I've got questions. I want to know where Murder Mom is. Uh, (laughs) Murder Mom. (laughs) Uh, It hurts because it's true. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Dad Um, Harper and Murder Mom. (laughs) <laughs> definitely is a superhero team for sure uh neil had a couple things to mention yes, too yes yes there was a chicken whizzy commercial <laughs> which i think is great during that coronation video which i think was great and he said it made it look like it was an entire restaurant chain instead of just like a th- one item of food maybe you it's know one item of food that they sell at a restaurant chain yeah maybe uh, he mentioned the Luther Grant Hotel, which is actually where Dr. Jace was put up by Jeff. 
and then he mentioned historically there's definitely there's definitely been some times in which Luther was modeled after um, uh, Mr. Trump. So that is hard not to think about <laughs> when you've got these hotel chains and everything else that he's doing. I I don't even know what to say with that. Moving on. <laughs> he said all Harper's one Grayson is his new jazz band name. So that's good. Yeah. <laughs> And he pointed out that it was Roy who ruined Brick's suit the last time <laughs> when we saw them fighting Brick on the wharf. He's just got a vendetta. I love which it. is hilarious. The explanation for the G designations. Yes. Which is uh, pretty great. Uh, also, he speculates that the Z de- designation that we saw with, uh, I think, Katana in one of the um, releases they did during Comic Con. Yeah. will probably be for the Batman Incorporated people, which is a Ooh. possibility. Because he can't use B, because we all that's already been taken. Right. <laughs> yes, you can't use it. I think it's G for Grayson, is what I had been assuming. Oh, nice. I like it. And he pointed out something, too, that I had, that I had saw, I'd saw, but I didn't put in my notes, which was when McGann grossed two extra arms oh, yeah. so that she can yeah. hold all four of Forager's arms. He's all, that is such good writing, storyboarding, everything. And I agree with you. I it's absolutely agree. It, brilliant. It, it made me go on the first time I saw it because it's so good. <laughs> it's such a good little comforting gesture. And it's part of McGann's whole thing that they put in that episode that I love every time it comes up that she just... Anytime people feel left out, she wants to include them because she knows she gets it. Yeah, for sure. And the last note on here. Oh, actually, there's two more notes. (laughs) One note on here from Neil was, Forager met Kid Flash. (laughs) (laughs) And the way Nightwing is just like, wait, no, No, not that. (laughs) ah." Nightwing is just like, there's too many teenagers talking at once. Oh, God, is this what we were like? (laughs) Oh, Jason Spiegel cracked me up. Um, and the last thing, which I guess we're going to end on. No. <laughs> yes. No. Episode five, we see Wolf sleeping. We finally get Wolf in the credits. Uh, I will just say, listen really closely to the end of that scene. <laughs> As anyone who has ever owned a canine will know what that is. That's all I'm going to say. Anyway. We have rearranged uh, the rest of our show a little bit. Uh, we have decided to move fan service up before crashing the mode so that those people who want to skip the crashing the mode sec- segment can do so, uh, but you won't miss the fan service. So let's get on to some fan service for this week. I've uh, admired your stance on animal rights for years. In fan service, we take some time to highlight the amazing fan related creations celebrating DC and Young Justice. And this week, we have an AMV, an animated music video, by Rachel, R-A-C-H-U-L-L. You can find it on YouTube. We'll have a link in the show notes. It's called Goodbye, My Friend, a Wally West tribute. The song is Gone Too Soon by the band Simple Plan. Yeah, and with all the talk of Wally and needing a sidekick and needing someone, you can. I'm tearing up thinking about this AMV. You can go and watch why Will knew that this was a thing that Dick needed. And uh, special thanks to our listener, uh, Beck LeBrant, who uh, emailed us with that recommendation as well. If you have any recommendations for artwork, cosplays, AMVs, or other creative work done by fans, email us at whelmpodcast at gmail.com or tweet at us at our Twitter account, and we will check it out. Uh, please keep the recommendations uh, family-friendly. That's the only qualification that we have. And now let's crash some mode. Because there's this one's some going stuff. long. Yeah, we need to get through this. Let's do okay, it. Okay, let's go. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. In Crashing the Mode, we'll be discussing potential storylines running through our heads based on the episodes released at the time of recording. So this Crashing the Mode is it's mostly four through six, but we might be harking back to one through three a little bit too. There is so much stuff going on in these episodes. Gosh, what do you want to start with? Want to start with want to start with Tara? Yeah. Let's talk about Tara a little bit. So, yeah, Tara Markov is a character who had been introduced in the Teen Titans in the 80s and betrayed the team in a classic Titans 4 issue arc called The Judas Contract. If you watch the Teen Titans animated series, she appears in there and there's also some, you know, things going on there. That was definitely 100% Tara dropping that rock on that guy. 
And it leads me to think, because Tara has a dynamic with Deathstroke, that Deathstroke may well be the one leading the shadows right now, which seems to make sense to me. I could believe that. I have, I have, I have theories and thoughts, but I could believe that. The dynamic between Deathstroke and Tara in Judas Contract was troublesome. So I'm hoping that this will be a different kind of dynamic, <laughs> but yeah. we will see. Yeah. 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 More towards more towards the Teen Titans animated one than the original. Yeah, that might I be would a good hope. idea. I'd I would hope. hope. I'd hope. <laughs> we mentioned a woman stepping out of the shadows at the yeah, end. Just, just some woman. <laughs> some woman with a baby randomly. Yeah. Who could who is who, who could, could that she be? be? Okay, so enough joking around. That's of course Talia Al Ghul, Raish's yeah. daughter, and the baby that she is holding is Damian Wayne, Bruce's yeah. son, who grows up in I'm gonna call it season six, uh, <laughs> and becomes the new Robin. I did not expect me doing math about pregnancy back during comics (laughs) commentary to actually come up and actually be relevant again this season but it was talia didn't appear in the animated series but she did appear as a highlight to one of the funniest blooper reels we've done yet (laughs) um where emily nearly killed me uh pointing out some things about talia and raish so um you can go check that out but yeah that's definitely talia it's comic that's commentary be- issue 11 for anyone who wants to go find right. the exact issue to see how talia plays and she has had a relationship with batman and we talked and theorized about it and we're like yeah damien does not exist in the universe in seasons one or two but we're like maybe possibly d- later down the line and yeah, later down the line is season three. Later down yeah. the line is right now. <laughs> Not yeah, apparently it's now. Um, also, the big thing that had lots of people screaming was <laughs> the the one ninja, along with Ubu, the guy with the red hood, <laughs> who in the who in the <clears throat> credits is credited as red hooded ninja, red hooded ninja, who says Grayson, who recognized Nightwing in his costume as Dick Grayson. It's got to be Jason Todd. Yeah. Um, so unlike the Under the Red Hood story, that was um, the animated film anyway, that was directed by Brandon Vietti, uh, written by John Wittick. He, uh, Rachel Ghoul resurrected Jason with the Lazarus Pit, but in that story, Jason went crazy because that's what happens when you're in the Lazarus Pit, come out of Lazarus Pit, and disappeared. And then, you know, shows up as Red Hood. In this one, apparently he didn't, and he's been being trained and raised by Rachel Ghoul and recovered, hopefully, by Rachel Ghoul, but he's been dead for at least three years, I'm guessing. Sometimes. So, he yeah, at this point. He's dead in season two. He's yep. Not so, anymore. I don't know if we're going to get Red Hood later this season, but I would imagine, once again, introducing him this early in the season means that we will, we, we will likely see some kind of Red Hood action before the end of the season, is my guess. Malafa Ak. Uh, we talked about how you can check out the comic commentary for me talking about Malafa Ak, but uh, as a bit of a reminder, Malafa Ak was responsible for the genocide of the Martians in the comics. And I have been talking about how strange it is that, that the Martians are still alive in Young Justice. So this could go horribly wrong. <laughs> I don't know. But... Also leading into that is Mantis. Mantis is the self-identified one of the bugs that self-identifies as Mantis. Mantis is a bug character who takes his tribe and leaves the new Genesis and basically vows fealty to Darkseid and becomes a supervillain. And if Makam has been psychically poking holes in Mantis and making him hate the new gods over and over and over again... This could potentially lead to that Mantis leaving and doing that thing with Darkseid. And speaking of that, I do want to point out, I pointed this out in our summary, but I want to go into it for a second, connected to all of this. When asked what he's doing, McCom just says, if I do some favors here, they'll help with this. He does not specify favors for who or why or yeah. what's happening. And that put me very on edge. Yeah. Like, that's not good. If we're being vague here, that's very not good. And if you think, like, Vandal's got a long plan from season one and two, Darkseid has, yeah. I, I, uh, yeah, I'm fascinated. And another thing, Neil pointed this out too. Both of us were 
pointing this out. Every scene, every scene in which Halo is regenerating herself with that violet light, every scene where Sphere is present when that happens, which I think is every scene except the first time it happens, yeah, her lights glow with the same color. And it's it's weird because there because Sphere comes into the scene and is always around. And I was like, why is Sphere like up in the because Sphere is not small. Right. So if you're putting her in a scene, you're putting her in a scene on purpose. And she, you know, she rolls up and then her lights like one of the times I saw it, I was like, is Sphere doing that to her? But then I was like, no, they clearly showed that when Sphere wasn't around the very first time. But there's something weird going on there. I don't know what it is, but it's clearly the same color. So yeah. I so is it some kind of mother box tech? You know, like when Sphere regenerates herself? I don't know. Neil Neil noticed the same thing. So I don't I don't we'll know. See. They we'll have see how that a is. connection. They have an understanding. They do apparently. have a connection of some sort. But you know, and as I mentioned in the last crash in the mode, I mean clearly Halo Halo is an ancient alien. So And that thing with Doctor Fate. Yeah, Doctor Fate basically calls that out. I find it interesting that Halo is not mentioning her history to Artemis when it comes up too. Like she's purposefully yeah. choosing not to say anything about that, which I find really interesting. I'm curious. Also, I'm feeling like that dude that throws a bottle at her and yells Is about somebody Karaki go home. He's got this spider web tattoo on his neck. He does. And I am thinking that's a person, but I don't know who that is yet. <laughs> That's a mood. That is a Young Justice mood. I think yeah. that's a person, but I'm that's not a, sure who it is. <laughs> that's going to matter, and I don't know why yet. So yeah. I don't I don't know yet. And we, we skimmed over it, but it's also like there's the whole thing where um, Halo chooses her own name. Halo picks a new name even after being told what her real name right. is. And that that's interesting. We'll yeah. see where that goes. She's Violet now. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot going on. And again, once again, we're kind of scratching the surface. We're not actually, dive, believe it or not, we are not diving in to a lot of things. But these are big ones. Um, so this is what this is what we're going to be doing. So keep that in mind for future crashing the modes if you don't want to be spoiled for things because there's some big stuff coming up. I can see it now. Or maybe not. Maybe the rest of the season is everybody just oh, you know hanging out, having chill. a good time. We got to plan did, a wedding. That's the whole season. What did Morgan Jenkins say? Nice show. That wouldn't hurt us at all. <laughs> Did you hear me show? <laughs> oh, I love that. I love Morgan. Anyway, <laughs> with all of that nonsense, uh, I think we can say it out of the Watchtower. Thank you all for spending time with us. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the yjfiles.tumblr.com, on our website, crashingthemode.com. And if all of that isn't enough, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend, either on social media or in real life, however you want to, and in joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show way more easily. And if you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S. We have to look a little bit harder to find those. And if you want to help us do more in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, conventions, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more, please consider supporting us through Patreon. For just a few dollars a month, you can help us while getting some rewards for yourself. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.